Hello, my name is Sterling Anderson. It's uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you, Jeff, for setting this up and for inviting me. Uh, Mark, it's a great presentation. Uh, when Mark and I talked a little bit about what he would be discussing and the fact that he'd be focusing on electric vehicles, I decided I would focus a lot less on them, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't start with a nod to them, um, as that's been a little bit of my life over the last several years. Uh, specifically, in uh, late 2014, um, I had uh, I was roped into leading this program. It's called the Model X uh, for Tesla. How many of you have driven a Model X or ridden in one? Okay, um, good. We need to get a little more penetration in Utah. Um, but uh, the the Model X was uh, at the time it was late 2014. We're about nine months from launch. Uh, extraordinarily challenging vehicle. A lot of new technology we had to develop for this this car, including those doors that you see there that are um, nowhere near as fun to to design as they. <laughs> are to operate. Um, but we went through the next uh, nine months, the team pulled off a pretty extraordinary feat, developing an SUV that, per every measure that I'm aware of, is the safest, the quickest, um, and the most technologically advanced sport utility vehicle ever built. Uh, but don't take my word for it, there's a quick video from Motor Trend that I think was kind of fun that uh, I thought this group might enjoy. All right. So this was our concept of what Motor Trend dubbed the Mommy Mobile. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about transportation, specifically where we've been, where we are today, where we're going in the future, and more, uh, and more specifically focus on um, a fundamental technology that will change not only this industry, but as Mark indicated, many other industries that it touches. So first, to, to start out, uh, the sort of mass-produced automobile has had a fundamental transformative impact on the socioeconomic fabric of all of the societies that it's touched in the, is this on? This is on in the 100 years or so since its uh, introduction. Specifically, uh, 100 years ago, uh, most traveled uh, fewer than 50,000 miles in their lifetime. Many lived and died without traveling more than 50 miles away from their home. Today, the average American travels over 13,000 miles every year. Um, this is largely uh, attributed to the existence of mass market, uh, of, of mass produced automobiles and, and personal mobility. Now, this mobility has fundamentally transformed these societies. It's unlocked economic opportunities, it's reshaped our cities, it has uh, provided access to uh, economic opportunities, uh, healthcare that was previously not uh, uh, available to society, but it's come at a pretty, pretty <laughs> tremendous cost as well. Um, every year in the world, we lose over one and a quarter million people to traffic accidents. Another 20 to 50 million are injured. Um, in the United States, alarmingly, this number is ticking up. It was about 40,000 people died on, in traffic-related accidents in 2017. Um, further, uh, the, from an emissions perspective, uh, mo uh, mobility uh, use cases, specifically uh, and most generally automobiles, are contributing over half of the carbon monoxides, um, the nitrous oxides to our atmosphere, um, while contributing a pretty substantial portion of other pollutants. That are, uh, that are added to the air every year. Um, while um, uh, you know, the personal vehicle is also incredibly uh, useful to the individual, it's also extraordinarily time and space inefficient. The average uh, personally owned automobile sits idle approximately 95% of any 24 hour day. This means that in the United States, there are approximately three parking spaces attributed, uh, uh, allocated to every vehicle, one at your home, one at your workplace, and one in shopping locales. Um, this is, this, some of this land that's assumed in parking related applications is some of our most precious in our homes, in our urban centers, um, and is an extraordinarily inefficient use of what could otherwise be, especially if uh, we can uh, evolve some of these powertrain technologies in, in uh, vehicle electrification, an otherwise relatively efficient asset. So this was important that we, that we resolve it. Um, what you see here is a, um, the land, uh, air, the land mass of covered by Delaware and Rhode Island. Um, parking spaces in the United States subsume what's been estimated to be something on the order of 3,600 square miles. This is greater than the land area covered by those two states uh, uh, in their entirety. A uh, little bit difficult to see here, but congestion uh, caused or contributed to by human drivers is pretty extraordinary. In the United States alone, we lose about five and a half billion people hours to congestion. Um, we lose further, about a, uh, as a result, about $300 billion uh, worth of productivity has been estimated to have been lost largely by beating patterns, by inefficient use of our roadways, largely caused or contributed to by the way that humans tend to navigate their cars uh, in and around other humans. Finally, as I mentioned, the 
broad availability of personal transportation while transforming our society has, as a natural result, locked many people out of many of the fundamental services that, that uh, society has come to rely on this transportation for. Specifically in the United States, about six million people with disabilities live without access to the transportation they need to get access to the healthcare and the other services and facilities that they require. And another tens of millions of people worldwide and also our elderly are um, pretty tremendously and detrimentally impacted uh, by the inability to get around. These were, um, so, so while, so the, the, the natural question that arises is how do we retain some of the benefits of the mass-produced vehicle that it's offered while ameliorating, uh, to some degree, some of the downsides um, that we've incurred. There are three specific, rather fundamental technologies, many of which have overlaps in terms of their contributions to one another that are coming to the world of transportation. Mark's touched a little bit on vehicle electrification, so I won't go too far into that. What I will focus on for a moment is ride sharing, but with a specific focus on self-driving. There, there is some degree of overlap or synergy between each of these technologies, specifically, uh, electric vehicles contribute to ride, share, uh, ride sharing. What it does for electric vehicles is offers a less range sensitive customer. Range anxiety, besides, you know, Mark talked a little bit about cost as a barrier to electric vehicle adoption. Range anxiety, we found, is, a, is another pretty substantial one. In ride sharing applications, that anxiety is lessened as most users um, experience the car for much shorter periods of time and are thereby not impacted quite as much. Uh, secondly, uh, self-driving. So ride-sharing benefits from both vehicle electrification and self-driving as, as both of these technologies will substantially reduce the cost uh, of ride-sharing. I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, the, uh, the overlap number one here uh, that I've illustrated uh, is, I think, not an obvious one for most who aren't steeped in self-driving. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but to give you a quick overview, the value of ride-sharing as it relates to self-driving, is it provides an incremental path to market for a technology that is hyper-localized and requires a gradual introduction. Self-driving is an extraordinarily complex problem. It requires adoption first on specific routes, specific roadways under certain conditions, and then more broadly. For a personal owner, many of these benefits uh, that self-driving affords would not be realized on a, on a large enough share of rides to make it worth their cost, uh, which will be fairly large in the early days. But ride sharing, if you consider the average New York City taxi is driving about 70,000 miles per year, about 60% utilization, that is a much larger mileage load over which to amortize the higher cost of the hardware that you have to install in the car um, on the order of you know, low tens of thousands of dollars to allow it to drive itself. Um, so first of all, in ride sharing, this is not a new concept. Um, as, uh, as they said in the 1940s, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. Um, ride sharing is, uh, uh, has certainly been around for a while, but it's changed in recent years, largely due to two things, the broad availability of GPS-enabled devices and mobile payments. And between those two, between 2011 and 2012, when we started to see sort of the first real app-based ride share companies start to emerge, and today, this has grown already to a nearly $50 billion market, about 17 to 20 billion uh, in the United States alone, about 30 billion in China, dominated by a number of very regionally specific players. Um, ride sharing is, is projected to continue to grow. Through 2025, I think the latest Morgan Stanley estimate had it appro uh, approaching $300 billion worldwide in revenue, which eclipses the world's uh, taxi market today. Um, so ride sharing, um, as it increases, there, there is one fundamental driver that will continue to drive this. Uh, and I think it's important that we highlight this here briefly. If you consider today that the average sort of Uber X price, uh, you know, pick your favorite. This is more illustrative than it is uh, specific. Um, but consider for a moment that the average American is driving about 13,000, 13,500 miles each year. If you amortize the cost of ownership of their vehicle over those miles, what you see is sort of the average cost per mile in total for those folks is still below this line. Importantly, it's not below this line today for those who drive fewer miles. And so what you see is this adoption, particularly in urban centers. I live in the San Francisco area. Uh, in the San Francisco area, it is cheaper to take a, an Uber or Lyft 100% of the time than it is to own a car. Um, this will increasingly become the case if we can reduce this cost. If we can get this down you know, on this order, we start to see much larger shares of the population start to adopt this as a result of the total cost of ownership becoming 
uh, uh, much less expensive. Uh, so that's important. In fact, today, it's not just San Francisco that's, uh, that's been influenced by this change in behaviors. Um, four of the top five cities in the United States, I think um, uh, the Dallas area is actually the only one that's not, that's not there yet. Washington, D.C., New York City, Los Angeles, Chicago, um, are all, in, in all of these cities, it's been estimated that today it is more economical to use a ride-sharing vehicle than it is to uh, own a personal car. Um, many surveys have, have been conducted about this. I think there was a survey a year ago or so. There were about 500-something people surveyed. I think it was Reuters uh, that ran this. What they found, so there was 500 people who had sold their car in the last calendar, in the last 12 months. Of those individuals, 9% uh, suggested that they would not, be, they, they, that their replacement for that vehicle would be exclusively ride-sharing. Another large share said that they would not be replacing, they would, wouldn't be replacing at all, they'd go down to fewer and they would use ride-sharing to some degree to supplement. Um, so we've see, we see it changing behaviors. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, if we can get this cost down, we will dramatically in, uh, increase its adoption and that adoption of ride sharing, not specifically self-driving, but that adoption of ride sharing will drive a number of efficiency improvements, uh, both societally and otherwise, uh, that will lead to some of the benefits that I've just described. So let's talk a little bit about self-driving. This is an area that I've been much more focused over the last decade or so. Uh, self-driving, the, um, the Society of Automotive Engineers years ago came up with a schema that, they, um, that has become adopted not only in sort of the marking language, but now more in the public dialogue. And I want to make sure we sort of disambiguate a couple of things about this dialogue, as I think it's largely become unhelpful as it creates the illusion that this is a continuous spectrum of technologies. Um, every time I hear someone refer to their Tesla driving itself, I cringe a little bit. Um, as I led that program at Tesla, this is a driver assistance system. Autopilot was specifically designed to assist the driver not to take over for the driver, and yet the driver treats it as a substitute for their driving, they will have uh, incurred the very complacency that we were worried about, which is they will be less ready to take over control when required uh, to avoid an accident when the system is unable to do it. So uh, specifically, so what I'll, the, the, the position that I'll take, or the point I'll make in the next page, is there are exactly two, uh, one or two of these that matter. There are a couple that don't. Um, partial automation where the system is controlling, doing the control of the car, but the driver is expected to remain in control, monitoring the environment, ready to take over as, as needed. This is referred to as partial automation or driver assistance system. This is what you see on the market today with Autopilot, with Cadillac Super Cruise, with some of these other technologies. Um, high automation, or self-driving as we refer to it, is specifically the ability of the vehicle to operate itself in a given environment, typically geofence, typically under certain condi environmental conditions that, that it has been validated for. But this is, uh, this is the technology, this is sort of the holy grail that gets us to much lower, price, uh, much lower cost points uh, for ride sharing and allows us to uh, realize many of the benefits of this technology. Importantly, no one today has a self, fully self-driving commercial product on public roads uh, in, in service of, of ride sharing. Many of us are working on it. Google has been working on it for many years. I'll talk to you a little bit about Aurora, a company that we founded uh, about two years ago um, that is certainly developing this. There are a few others as well. Um, but high automation is very much a sort of work in progress right now and a technologically extraordinarily complex problem. I think Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, referred to it as the def one of the defining uh, artificial intelligence problems of our generation, uh, if not the century. So. A few of the key distinctions um, that I briefly had on the previous page that I'll talk a little bit about for a moment. Driver assistance uh, is there to support the driver. As a result, when developing a driver assistance system like Autopilot, you tend to focus on minimizing false positives. You cannot afford to have uh, a, a vehicle traveling 75 miles an hour down the freeway false positive off of some object in the road for which it doesn't need to brake, slam on the brakes and, and, and cause a collision by doing so. So that is typically you bias the development of, of driver assistance systems to avoid these false positives. As a natural result, you will miss true positives. There will be occasions where the vehicle will not emergency brake when it should have emergency brakes. Um, but this is part of why they're tuned this way. Uh, at Tesla, there was a phenomenal opportunity that we had to develop in shadow mode, to collect a lot of data uh, from the roadway, to uh, view before we'd ever release a given product, 
we were able to observe, did the system think it should have, have braked? We obviously didn't as we were still in shadow mode, but then did the driver brake? If the driver didn't brake and the system would have triggered a brake, what can we learn from that? What can we tune? What can we change before we make this feature live so that we avoid doing the wrong thing? Similarly, if we didn't trigger a brake and yet we saw the driver either hard brake or collide with the vehicle in front of them, what can we learn from that? How can we tune the algorithm? This was a, this was a um, uh, sort of a case study in the uh, value of that data in real world environments uh, for developing a system like this. Um, self -drive, in the self-driving world, you cannot afford to miss anything, whereas in self-driving you can. And so in, uh, as I mentioned, you know, some of these accident statistics, the one and a quarter million people that are killed each year, these sound like a lot. But when you get into it, think about this on a sort of single driver basis. In the United States today, uh, I think NHTSA's latest report was like 1.13 people die for every 100 million vehicle miles traveled. That's about 88 million vehicle miles traveled per fatality. If you consider for a moment that the average American, as I mentioned earlier, drives about 13,000 miles per year, that's 6,700, 6,700 uh, person years of driving. At a 65 year sort of driving life, that's over 100 lifetimes of driving per every fatality that's incurred. Now I want you to consider for a moment how many odd cases you would have encountered on the roadway at an intersection at other places in 100 lifetimes of driving. How many times that a ch a, would a child have crossed in front of you in the middle of an ex intersection and dropped a snow cone and a bike swerved around them and a truck paused when you wouldn't have ex otherwise expected it to pause? These are the kind of use cases that you have to deal with in self-driving. If you can't deal with them, to the tune of 100 lifetimes between fatalities, you haven't met the bar set by humans. So it's an extraordinarily challenging problem. It is much more difficult than I think many appreciate on an individual driver level. I'll talk with you a little bit about, um, before I go into some of the self-driving challenges, I'll show you some examples of uh, the driver assistance systems that we've developed in the past. First, uh, this is a video that I'll show you from, uh, that sort of tiles together what we had envisioned for the driver assistance systems that we were developing at Tesla. Um, then I'll show you some videos that were, that were shared with us, uh, or, or shared, I guess, with the world on YouTube from dash cams that various Tesla owners mounted in their cars. Um, So this is what we had envisioned, and um, you know, part of this was how do we create a set of features that cover sort of end to end what one's sort of lifestyle usage of these vehicles would look like. But this was the much more important part of what we were doing. What you see there, and I'm going to back that up for a minute because uh, uh, because I want to preface it for a moment. Uh, this is, again, dash cam video shared on YouTube by the driver of one of our vehicles who was, I think, in Europe uh, driving behind these other vehicles. You'll notice the car in front of them didn't slow, didn't stop, and yet you hear us throw an alarm for them. What we were doing is looking at the radar signature of the car ahead of them. So specifically, you get a ground reflection off of the road underneath the car in front of you that provides you visibility that the human doesn't have. And as a result, we're able to see that red car before it actually starts to break, warn the driver, cause them to start to break before this happens. Oh, 
Refer to these as level one systems on that SA scale. Here we see the deer warn the driver. They brake here again. You see the signature of a car ahead of this one. And alert the driver, who is not happy. All right. Um, so that's valuable. Right? There is certainly there is value to be found in, in uh, sort of the, the introduction of some of these safety features. There's much more to be unlocked, both through self-driving, but in specifically self-driving as applied to ride sharing. Uh, what you'll see here is some estimates that we ran many years ago uh, in which we estimated that over half of the market uh, estimated uh, to be quite large uh, for self-driving is coming from ownership and parking. And, I, and I, I, don't, I don't want you to index too much on this number because uh, if we assume for a moment our, uh, that in the United States alone, every year we're driving about three trillion miles, assume a 10% take rate on that. If you were to charge 10 cents per mile, and most ride-sharing applications is much more opportunity than that, but assume for a moment only 10 cents per mile, this is a $300 billion revenue opportunity in the United States alone. Worldwide, it climbs to about 700 billion. So if you're curious why the kinds of capital infusions that are happening in self-driving today are happening, in spite of us not having a product, in spite of us still being very deep in the weeds of the development, this is because the market, in terms of its impact on uh, you know, real estate sectors, its impact on commerce, its impact on transportation of goods, its impact on mobility services, um, is tremendous uh, and, and will change a lot about our society and have a pretty large uh, opportunity for us. Self-driving has gone through a few developmental phases. I started uh, during phase one. This is back in the DARPA Grand Challenge days. So DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency of the United States, kicked off a series of challenges, um, in which uh, the first of which was in the desert, um, Southern California to Nevada. Uh, zero teams completed that race. I think the furthest team went seven or so miles, um, crashed into a cactus. Uh, others decided to park themselves on the roof. There were some really interesting behaviors that uh, you know had been uh, inadvertently designed. Um, phase two, so, so during this phase, I'll say that the prevailing mentality in the space, particularly by those who had traditionally owned it, the automakers, um, was A, ride sharing is a plaything of the Department of Defense, it's not gonna really change our industry, and B, ride sharing, which we know is Zipcar in those days, is also not particularly interesting to us. It's not gonna change much. Enter phase two, 2009 to 2015. Uh, the Google co-founders saw some opportunity here and kicked off a program that got the attention of the automakers, but really only their curiosity. At the time, the prevailing mindset um, was, you know, uh, self-driving may end up being an interesting technology, but certainly we've got our own in-house teams and they can figure it out if, if it gets there. Uh, and then ride sharing, uh, well, it looks like maybe there will be some urban centers that pick this up as evidenced by what's, what's happening with Uber today, but it's probably not, it's probably not something that, you know, existential for us. Enter phase three, which, you know, one could refer to as the collective sort of freak out phase, um, where many of these automakers now realize, wow, not only is self-driving uh, going to happen, but it's going to fundamentally transform our product. And if we don't, if, if our product is not able to compete here, uh, we've just been outmoded, and a, and a century old business is changing underneath our feet. And at the same time, uh, these opportunities in ride sharing were really, were really started to uh, pick up. And we started to see these intensely regional competitions start to pick up there, where Uber and, and Didi fought it out in China. Ultimately, China prevailed there. Kareem prevailed in, this, in um, the Middle East, Grab in Southeast Asia. Um, there were a number of sort of um, these companies have probably started to pop up, Ola and India and others. Um, but but the, the net result was suddenly an intense focus on this technology development and on the ride-sharing application of the technology. There are a few technological enablers that have really shifted over the past several years. Um, these, were, these were technological changes that when we founded Aurora, we decided it was a unique opportunity to take advantage of, specifically. On the sen in the sensing space, both in LiDAR and in radar, um, cameras driven by a lot of the consumer applications, there have been tremendous advances in the technology we had available to us to make sense of the world around us on multiple wavelengths, which is important. 
computationally, what, what was uh, you know, something on the order of 40 cores and an air conditioner on the roof of the DARPA Grand Challenge vehicle that was built at MIT, uh, turned into the kinds of SOCs that companies today are creating, a, a couple of companies today are creating with extraordinarily high computational power for fairly low uh, power budgets, uh, which has changed things a little bit. And then finally, that was important because of this. The revolution that started in machine learning about 20 years ago has really accelerated in the last few years. In 2014, uh, deep learning neural networks, which had been around for a long time, but were not used in, at quite the scale as they are today, uh, really started to take hold. And what we started to see as a result is we started to realize there were opportunities to create pipelines and learn the behaviors of the roadway, which is an, which is an unbounded uh, and extraordinarily complex uh, um, combinatorial problem that one has to solve um, that machine learning is pretty well suited towards, um, much like a human uh, in what we do. Now, in late 2016, which is when I left Tesla and we founded Aurora, the space looked something like this to an OEM. You had a couple of very experienced, um, pretty strong players, um, but they were threatening. If you're an automaker, if you're one of the big three automakers in the United States, your combined market capitalization in late 2016 is something on the order of $120 billion. You've been around for a century. You now look at Uber, Didi, and Lyft, the top three ride-sharing players. Their mar combined market capitalization, about 100 to $140 billion. They've been around for less than a decade. When you see this, and you get in a room with one of these guys, and you're used to looking at those who you work with as you know, traditional suppliers, uh, suddenly you feel a little bit like a Foxconn, right? You feel a little bit like, wow, I, if I work together with these giant technology companies, uh, there is a reasonable concern that I may not have a meaningful role to play outside of providing the sort of white label vehicle uh, to the network. At the same time, you had a number of other players who were in the uh, who were perceived as higher risk to an automaker as they were less experienced, certainly, than the, some of these larger programs were, um, but they were more compatible. Um, and so what you saw in that time was uh, General Motors purchased Cruise, Delphi purchased Newtonomy, uh, a number of players started placing bets in this space. But what we saw was an opportunity to play here. So there's a, there's a space for an, extre an extremely uh, experienced team who is uh, all at, at once both experienced and compatible, or non-threatening, and able to partner with the automotive world to bring this technology to market. So we founded Aurora. The model then was threefold. Build an extraordinarily experienced team. Build from a clean sheet on the latest developments in, in these technologies that I've referred to, um, both in hardware and software. And finally, form a broad coalition of partnerships across the industry. We formed partnerships with Volkswagen Group, the, one of the largest automakers in the world, Hyundai, Hyundai Kia Genesis, who is uh, you know, also uh, one of the largest automakers in the world, Byton, and a couple of others that we haven't announced. But as we formed this coalition, as we brought together this team, the, the VP of software for SpaceX, if you saw the sort of relanding of the rockets, he's the guy who led the team who did that. Uh, the haul truck program, which is the only commercially operating autonomous vehicle in uh, mines uh, across the world, the directors of this program, uh, we brought to Aurora. There were a number of very experienced people, and what that did is allowed us to start from a clean sheet with the benefit of having seen many of the pitfalls of this technology, seen the pitfalls of its development. As we brought together that team, we believed fundamentally that it was important not just to bring together people that were good, but people that were good people. And so we, were, uh, we indexed heavily on the values of Aurora. And before we brought anyone in, we ran them by and confirmed their sort of consistency with a set of values that are very important to us. First, operate with integrity. Uh, it's important to us that we not overpromise in this technology because we know that it is so uh, that it can be so uh, positive for the world that if we blow it by overblowing our promises by prematurely launching it in the market, we will have uh, we will incur you know greater costs to society. Focus, uh, be reasonable, set outrageous goals and no jerks. I think most of these are fairly straightforward, so I won't expound on them. But one comment that I'll make on cost um, uh, here, because I think this is, this is one that, that, that many, uh, many have asked, and that is, 
is it sufficient to launch a vehicle with only a small set of sensors? Can you do this? Can you safely do this? What's the actual cost that you need to incur in one of these vehicles to launch it safely? And what I'll suggest here is as a, as a result of the technological complexity of solving this problem that I mentioned earlier, it is important that you launch it with all of the technology you need to maximize the probability uh, that you have both detected uh, and predicted the future motion of other actors in the world. And that is best done when you have various sensing technologies with orthogonal failure modes. So what you see here is some of our vehicles driving autonomously in various environments. This one here is in some reason these aren't playing. Um, but this one here is in uh, California. What you see here is a tunnel in Pittsburgh. What you see here is a snowstorm in Pittsburgh on different modalities. So here you see the camera. Um, what you'll see if this video starts to play again, or what you may have seen when it started, was a bicyclist who approaches this intersection at night uh, with only the illumination of the headlights the bicyclist can be a little bit difficult to see. Um, the good news is that when you illuminate the in this same environment with both uh, millimeter wave uh, radar um, and <coughs> infrared lidar, you are able to observe that bicyclist to much higher precision, uh, to, with much higher precision recall. Down here you see us operating in a tunnel. What you'll see is a spray of these purple points that the radar sees um, by way of other reflections. This can be difficult to make sense of if all you have is radar, but if you have camera and LIDAR together, you're suddenly able to observe the world uh, with much higher accuracy. Finally, with the LIDAR, what you see uh, in this video is sort of falling snow. Um, the laser uh, bounces off of many of these particles in the air, and as a result, has noise. And so complementing the orthogonal failure modes of each sensor this way allows us to bring the technology to market more quickly. Now, it also causes the system to be more expensive. And a word on cost here, one can bring a safe product to market earlier if it's expensive and cost it down over time as the volume grows, or one can wait longer to bring an inexpensive product to market. Or one can do the sort of deleterious approach, which, I, uh, which you know, the, the hope is that no one does, which is bring an unsafe, insufficient product uh, just because it's cheap to market uh, prematurely and thereby cause problems for the industry. What you see here is an overhead drone view. Uh, the team has overlaid what this car is seeing on the video. Uh, so you'll see it's sort of uh, created boxes around, it's, it's perceiving with radar, li laser, and camera various objects. It's, uh, you'll notice as it comes through here and these cars become unoccluded, it will detect them as such. Again, this is sort of benefiting from some of these uh, machine learned and, and highly engineered approaches. Here you'll see this car, if this video uh, starts playing, that's detecting these bicycles as they drive around it. Again, on the same sensor modalities. There we go. And then finally, this, this one's interesting. Um, as in California, this is legal. I don't know if it's legal in Utah, um, but uh, you'll see a motorcycle lane splitting. Um, this can be pretty complex uh, for a perception system to detect. Certainly, as he's nestling himself between these two cars, a, a, a perception system, uh, it, it can be very difficult to distinguish that motorcycle from the other cars around you. And if you can't distinguish them, it's very difficult for you to predict how he's going to move as distinct from the cars uh, into which he's sort of blending. But the way the system has been engineered, again, with, the with an experienced team, with the benefit of hindsight of systems that have been developed in the past, they were able to develop a system uh, that did this well. A uh, final point that I'll make on our approach at Aurora, um, we refer to this as not building a ladder to the moon. Um, years ago, Larry Jackal at Bell Labs made a comment. He said, don't build a ladder to the moon. And the, the, what he was referring to was the natural inclination in some engineering teams of building incrementally on what we know um, because it's gratifying. It makes progress every day. We see that, that, that progress is observable. The challenge with it is if you have a distance like 250,000 miles to travel, a ladder is insufficient and won't get you there. Even though it's gratifying, even though it feels less risky. Instead, you need a rocket ship. Now, the difference being that rocket ship, the analog in the sort of develop, development world is you may not see visible progress early on. At Aurora, we have eschewed demoware. Uh, we have done very few demos. We've been very fortunate on the capital front to not have to, as, as most uh, the, the, the credibility of some of the work that we've done in the past has sort of spoken for itself, but 
the, if you focus on building this ladder, on building successive demos and incrementally building technology, you won't make it. And so we've, we've tried to sort of um, you know, focus the team on building that rocket, um, specifically focusing on early investments where that performance or the sort of observable performance will be low in the early days, but will take off uh, pretty rapidly thereafter. So this is why I'm excited about this space. This is why I've uh, been involved in it for, for some time. This is why we founded Aurora, is we think we can make a pretty a substantial difference in the world uh, through self-driving. And this is a journey I'm excited to, uh, to see through to, to fruition uh, with all of you. So hopefully you'll, you'll see some of the fruits of this work uh, in the years to come. Thank you.